Good afternoon, everyone. I think we should probably get started. Uh, I'm uh, John Posios. I'm the director of the Desotel Center for Private Enterprise and the Law here at Robson Hall. And it is my pleasure on behalf of the Desotel Center and Robson Hall to welcome you all here today. We have members, uh, we have students here, we have faculty, but we also have uh, guests from the, uh, the bar and other uh, faculties uh, from uh, uh, the University of Manitoba. So we're uh, welcome to those of you who aren't uh, from Robson Hall. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Catherine Rand, uh, who is Dean and uh, Floyd B. Sperry Professor at the University of North Dakota School of Law. Uh, with uh, Dean Rand is Stephen uh, Light, who's a PhD and a professor of political science at the University of North Dakota College of Business and Public Administration. Uh, Rand and Light have written over 40 articles and three books on Indian gaming, including Indian Gaming and Tribal Sovereignty, The Casino Compromise, which was featured on C-SPAN's Book TV. They have testified before the U.S. Senate Committee on Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C., and have served as consultants to numerous corporate, tribal, state, and local officials. Rand and Light are frequent commentators in the national media, including the New York Times, Boston Globe, and Bloomberg. Uh, together with their generous um, offer or acceptance of our invitation to speak today, they spoke also at, with my class yesterday. They did a terrific job, so I, uh, I uh, welcome you to uh, join us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for the generous introduction and for the opportunity to, to speak with you today. What a terrific facility this is. Um, and we, on behalf of Catherine, we want to thank you for the opportunity to be here, for John's assistance in helping to put this together. Um, also, of course, to Dean Axworthy and to Sue and Pat and the administrative staff and everyone who's helped us out along the way. What a, what a terrific place and a facility this is. And we also would like to say um, that we're thrilled at the opportunities for institutional collaboration that we are developing um, and that we see a, a bright future for that, building the connections between our institutions, especially on issues related to First Nations uh, and American Indian related issues. So look forward to that in the future. We'd also just point out in the United States, actually, it is Native American Heritage Month, uh, the month of November, and so uh, we're happy to, to, to be extending that um, here into Canada as well. Um, <laughs> ambassadors of a sort, I don't know. Um, in any event, we're going to be talking with you today in our patented, or I guess it should be patented, maybe John can help us with that, uh, team-based approach. And so, uh, as John pointed out, um, I'm uh, in political science and public administration in the business and public administration school, and Catherine's over at the law school. And so our work has been collaborative um, throughout our careers, and so we're going to bring that to you today. Uh, you'll forgive us, because we'll be doing some alternating, but hopefully that'll help to enhance the presentation rather than detract from it. We founded uh, in 2002 at the University of North Dakota the Institute for the Study of Tribal Gaming Law and Policy, um, and we decided it would be a good opportunity to have an institutional hub for the work that Catherine and I were doing uh, anyway, and it has been a, a great opportunity for us to further the research and scholarship on what is known as Indian gaming in the United States, um, also to bring that to the classroom, and again, we were thrilled to be in, in John's class yesterday where the students did a terrific job of, of negotiating on a government-to-government -government basis, a tribal state compact. We also take very seriously a service mission um, to conduct outreach to all interested parties and stakeholders. And as well, um, we do provide consulting services, as John mentioned, to different parties because after all, tribal gaming, like First Nations gaming, is a major industry with a lot of different types of players. Um, so. We also would just, in the spirit of shameless self-promotion, point you to our website. Um, and we have some information up here as well. But Indian Gaming Now, uh, which we've also founded as the first blog in the United States devoted to issues related to tribal gaming, where we try and keep folks up to date with what's going on. And incidentally, uh, we will be writing up a blog post on this wonderful event and uh, giving some PR to, to the Faculty of Law and the University of Manitoba as well. Um, so. So what we wanted to start with today is to talk a little bit about the story of Indian gaming in the United States. 
Indian gaming has captured American imagination in a number of ways. First of all, of course, it's gambling. And Americans are in love with gambling. We have had an unprecedented expansion of legalized gambling in the United States. And at the same time, it's also about American Indian tribes. And in the U.S., your average citizen does not know that much about American Indian tribes. But because Indian gaming is in the news literally every day in the United States, literally every day, much of what Americans know about tribes and tribal members is through the lens of Indian gaming. So we wanted to talk a little bit about why the story is important and start with the way that it's told through popular media in the United States. So as we've been looking at these issues over time and as we were actually um, conducting research for our first book on the issue, we decided, you know, the media images are actually exceptionally important and significant and that tribal gaming has brought American Indian tribes into popular culture and, and made them visible in ways uh, that they were not before. Now, as you look across a range of pop culture, you'll see references to tribal gaming, and that's the lens through which we see tribes. Uh, I, we can't really think of a better way to start than with The Simpsons, now in its 20th or maybe 50th year, uh, I'm not sure. Um, and just about every issue, of course, in pop culture has been referenced in The Simpsons at some point. There's been more than one reference to, to tribal gaming um, on The Simpsons. And here, uh, before I think they retire to a sweat lodge, um, Homer and Bart are getting some sage advice from folks that... Uh, for whatever reasons, are trust, dressed up in some form of traditional garb. And on Big Love, uh, an interesting juxtaposition of moral frameworks where Bill is working, our patriarch, Bill, is working out a deal with the tribe to try to get his own gaming enterprise off the ground. For those of you... Do you get CSI up here? Of course, yeah. Uh, I, I can't, we don't really watch a lot of it, but um, so, yes. Uh, there was an episode of CSI where David Caruso and the crew had to <laughs> investigate uh, a killer who actually ended up having ties to a tribal casino. The reason that we know, of course, that this individual uh, was an American Indian is because the individual who was murdered was scalped. And on Family Guy, uh, the accurate rendition of the American family, of course, uh, Peter loses his shirt at Geronimo's Palace, a tribal casino, while long-suffering wife Lois looks on. And then there's South Park. Um, now, of course, it's satire, and we need to understand that. Um, but, uh, you know, satire can cut both ways and kind of wrap back around and meet itself at some point. And in the episode entitled uh, Red Man's Greed, in this instance, an American Indian tribe actually bought an entire town for the purpose of monopolizing the casino operations and built a superhighway right to the casino door. On The Sopranos, Tony and his crew are surprised to find out that the CEO of a tribal casino modeled loosely on the Foxwoods Resort Casino in Connecticut has much in common with them and does not look like their perception of a traditional Native American. Instead, they're impressed by his cutthroat business savvy in this setting. Not sure how many of you are Onion readers, um, but uh, so again, satire, and uh, we're shocked and surprised to learn that actually, as you can see, uh, the Indian casino uses every part of the dollar. And if you're not clear on that reference, you can talk to us later on. <laughs> but these stories aren't limited to sitcoms, uh, satire, or drama on cable TV. Instead, they also influence how the American mainstream media reports on Indian gaming. A few years ago, Time magazine ran a cover story that was titled The Wheel of Misfortune. And the cover story's focus, it was actually two parts, uh, was, its focus was on the disaster 
of the experiment of Indian gaming in the U.S. From Time Magazine's perspective, tribes in the U.S. were either too rich from Indian gaming, like the Mashantucket Pequots, who own and operate Foxwoods Resort Casino, or they were too poor, like many of the Sioux and Dakota tribes in uh, North Dakota and South Dakota. And either way, Time Magazine seemed to say, Indian gaming had not worked the way that it was intended by our federal government. At the same time, Time Magazine charged that giving tribes any role in regulating their own gaming enterprises was akin to the fox guarding the hen house. Or as Time Magazine put it, it was like Enron regulating itself. And of course, there's the Jack Abramoff scandal, uh, some of the ripple effects still being felt um, but arguably K Street and Washington lobbyists have gotten over this. But at the time, and you, you may know some of the background on this, um, the questions that were raised about the Jack Abramoff scandal, this powerful lobbyist who was attempting uh, in various nefarious and even criminal ways to gain political influence in Washington on behalf of his tribal clients, in many ways this story was really, as it was framed, more about those clients, more about the tribes either as victims or as sort of pushing, you know, in ways that they shouldn't be for tribal gaming. And although this was seen as ultimately perhaps about Abramoff, it was also about an industry that was out of control. So with that kind of background, we'd like to tell you a little bit about the real story. Uh, of course, there are many stories behind tribal gaming. But we thought this was a nice opportunity to present to you beyond just popular culture, beyond the scandal stories and that sort of thing, some basic background on Indian gaming in the U.S. and give you a sense of what's going on down there, some ways to think about um, some comparative perspectives also on First Nations gaming. And so we want to start talking about uh, some background for you on American Indian tribes. So let me take a few moments to just talk a little bit about, as Steve said, the background of American Indian tribes and how they fit within our political system in the United States. We have over 560 federally recognized uh, Indian tribes in the U.S. and about four and a half million people uh, self-identify as either American Indian or Alaska Native in the U.S. That's only about 1.5% of the entire U.S. population. Of course, this varies by state. In North Dakota, for example, uh, Native Americans make up our largest uh, non-white ethnic or racial group at about 5% of our state population. Our entire state population, of course, is about 640,000. Federal recognition is the federal government's uh, acknowledgement that this group is an American Indian tribe and as an American Indian tribe has inherent political and legal authority. So federal recognition of a tribe is the recognition of that tribe's sovereign status. And of course, uh, Indian lands come into play as well. By this map, you can see that federal reservations in the United States are very much concentrated in the West. That's an artifact of an era of Indian policy, removal and relocation. So there are very few on the, on the eastern side of the country, not because there were not indigenous peoples there, but because many of them were relocated to reservations in the western part of the, of the country to accommodate uh, the expansion of uh, white settlement. So in our U.S. political system, uh, with the idea of federalism, the division of authority between a federal government and state governments, where although we have a national government, state governments also retain governmental authority, we actually have a third sovereign within that system, and that is those 562 tribal governments. They, too, have sovereign political and legal authority under uh, federal law. 
As I mentioned before, tribes are recognized in the U.S. as sovereign nations with inherent powers of self-government. They pre-existed our United States Constitution, meaning that the tribes were here before we ever dreamed up our U.S. Constitution. And the tribes are also extra-constitutional in the sense that they did not participate in our constitutional convention. Unlike our state governments, which through the constitutional process delegated their authority to create a federal government, the tribes have never um, uh, actively given up any of their authority to the United States. Now that said, the United States has asserted that it does have authority over tribes. Uh, for this assertion, it relies on two main areas of law. The first is the idea that under our Constitution, the federal government has the power to uh, regulate commerce with the Indian tribes. That Commerce Clause, the so-called Indian Commerce Clause of our Constitution, has been interpreted by the court and by, uh, by the federal courts and by our federal government in a way so that the federal government actually has power over Indian tribes. That power is plenary, meaning that it is exclusive to our federal government. The states have no authority over tribes, even those tribes that reside within their borders. The only way that the states have any authority over tribes under U.S. law is if our Congress delegates it to the states, which it has done on occasion. At the same time that the federal government exercises authority over tribes, it also has acknowledged that it has a trust responsibility to tribes. That trust responsibility stems from uh, hundreds of treaties that were entered into with, with tribes, but also stems from this idea that as the discovering nation, the United States owes something to tribes. It owes something to tribal members to ensure their health, safety, and welfare. So that's your crash course on federal Indian policy. Um, and again, we're, we're assuming there's a lot of terrific knowledge in the room, but we want to give you some of that background, again, since it's comparative. Um, in thinking about the growth of the tribal gaming industry, you can start with the fact that it really is more or less just two decades old, which is really quite remarkable, um, the various successes, the growth of the industry, uh, the pervasiveness, pervasiveness of it. Back in the 1980s, uh, at the time that this concept of gambling on tribal reservations was just germinating, um, in 1988, when federal law was first enacted, there were about 100 uh, high-stakes card rooms and bigo operations for tribes throughout the U.S., mainly in, in Florida and California. And they were generating some good revenue, particularly on relatively resource-poor reservations, about $120 million or so. But as you look at just 20 years later, and I think we'd be hard-pressed to think about other industries other than perhaps the growth of web-based technology and that sort of thing that have um, grown so exponentially, you have, as you can see, about 425 casino operations that are scattered throughout the United States, operated by over 225 tribes, um, which is a large number of tribes, obviously, in 28 states, uh, and also generating last year about $26.5 billion in, in revenue. That's just for some perspective, that's about three times the revenue um, that was generated on the Las Vegas Strip. Now, of course, many, many more facilities, uh, but still it gives you some comparative sense there. So let's take you back in time. Let's get in the time machine now, because you're getting a crash course in Indian gaming as well. And if you go back to the glory days of the Reagan years at that point, that's where everything really starts a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, where, where we have the roots of Indian gaming and the signing of the Federal Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which we'll now talk about. So our roots of Indian gaming are uh, tied to the expansion of legalized gambling in the U.S. 
beginning in the late 60s into the 70s and then certainly continuing throughout the 80s, 90s and into our, our current century, we've had an explosion of legalized gambling. Commercial casinos are no longer limited to Las Vegas and Atlantic City. Almost every state has a state lottery. Almost every state allows charitable gambling. Many states allow uh, betting on horse races or have racinos, the combination of a racetrack and a casino. In fact, in the United States, only two states completely prohibit gambling altogether, Hawaii and Utah. Every other state has some form of legalized gambling within its borders. So Indian gaming came along at a time when Americans were embracing gambling as entertainment, embracing gambling as a pastime. Now tribal sovereignty is a defining characteristic of Indian gaming and separates it from commercial casinos or even uh, charitable gambling. So Indian gaming is very different than those forms of gaming. Indian gaming is more like a state lottery. It's government run, government operated, government regulated, and it is enacted for public policy purposes. So tribes had this authority because they were sovereign nations, because of their inherent legal authority. The U.S. Supreme Court recognized that in a 1987 case, California v. Cabazon Band of Mission Indians. There, the Cabazon Band, along with the Morongo Band in Southern California, had been operating a high-stakes uh, bingo palace, as well as some card rooms on their reservations. They got people to come to their bingo games because they offered higher jackpots than were allowed by the state for charitable bingo. So the state tried to shut down their high-stakes bingo palaces and said that essentially state regulation would apply on those reservations, that the tribes did not have the power to offer gambling that did not comply with state law. And the Supreme Court said, of course they do. They're sovereign, and the states generally have no authority over tribes. So in Cabazon, the court said that unless you were a state like Utah, where you prohibited gambling entirely as a matter of state public policy, unless you did that, then state, you had no business regulating Indian gaming. If it wasn't completely against your state public policy, then tribes would have the inherent power to operate gambling free of state regulation. So as you think about what happens next in the aftermath of this legal landmark, this bombshell that's been dropped by the Supreme Court, there was a big scramble, what to do. The states were very concerned at the idea that the Supreme Court has suggested that they have no authority over what's happening in terms of gambling on reservations. The commercial casino industry, pretty much limited at the time to Las Vegas and Atlantic City, those interests were very, very concerned at this as well. Um, and Congress also was concerned at the idea of a potential mushrooming of legalized gambling. So in that, through that process, you have the generation of legislation with a lot of different hands on it. And you have um, a compromise, as we call it, a, a series of compromises that are embodied in the Federal Indian Gaming Regulatory Act of 1988, or IGRA. And in IGRA, what Congress was trying to do was accomplish some basic policy goals that are actually very intriguing in the context of this public gaming and public policy idea. First and foremost, what Congress uh, recognized at the time was that, com that gaming in this new form of economic development could be beneficial to tribes who through historical, for historical reasons, were extremely resource poor on their reservations. And so the first policy goal is to promote tribal economic development, to promote tribal self-sufficiency, which overlaps with the Reagan era policy of self-determination and generally devolving power back to the states, and also um, allowing tribes to to become self-sufficient and less dependent in the eyes of the administration on the federal government for resources and programs, and also to produce strong tribal governments 
to create the necessary institutions of governance that can deliver public services to their constituents. Now, the, same public, the second public policy goal is to ensure the legality and the fairness of the gambling operations. Because if you're going to open this up, um, you've got to make sure that those operations, first of all, are fair, are perceived as fair to their potential patrons. And secondly, there was a lot of concern at the time, based on the Las Vegas model and the genesis there, and Atlantic City as well, about organized crime. So the second main public policy goal is to regulate and create layers of regulation in, in order to ensure the fairness of the games and prevent the infiltration of criminal elements. So to achieve those two basic policy goals, IGRA set forth a legislative regulatory scheme for Indian gaming. First of all, as I mentioned before, Indian gaming is conceived of as public gaming in the sense that it is government operated, government owned, and uh, adopted for public policy purposes. It's not the same as a for-profit commercial casino. Secondly, under IGRA, Indian gaming is allowed to be operated by an Indian tribe, meaning a federally recognized Indian tribe. No other entity has the power or the authority to operate Indian gaming. And Indian gaming must be operated on Indian lands, which are defined by the statute. All federal reservations easily meet the definition of Indian lands. IGRA further said that as long as the state didn't fully prohibit gaming within its borders, then tribes would be uh, able to operate Indian gaming in that state. So this, too, was meant as a protection, and it should sound familiar because it stems from the Cabazon case. So a state like Utah, which completely prohibits, Indian, uh, completely prohibits gambling altogether, even though it has Indian tribes and Indian lands within its borders, IGRA does not authorize those tribes to operate Indian gaming. But a state like North Dakota, which has charitable blackjack, a state lottery, and other forms of legalized gambling, where we have Indian tribes and Indian lands, those tribes are authorized under IGRA to operate Indian gaming. So it was a compromise between state authority and tribal authority. Congress was trying to satisfy both. And it did that in an important way through the classification of games. So regulatory jurisdiction is assigned according to what kind of game is at issue. Class one gaming uh, is traditional tribal games that are generally associated with tribal ceremonies. Those are simply not regulated under IGRA at all. The tribe has exclusive jurisdiction over class one gaming. And there has been little, if any, controversy or litigation whatsoever over class one gaming. So IGRA concentrates on two other classes, class two and class three. Class two gaming is basically bingo in all of its forms, including electronic bingo. For those of you who have seen an electronic bingo machine, which does not look like something that your grandmother would have played, but she may play it these days, it very much resembles a slot machine. Yet the game actually played on the console is a live bingo game. That would still be, for the most part, class two gaming. Class three gaming is everything else. For the most part, casino style gaming. Roulette, poker, blackjack, table games, and of course, slot machines. For that class three casino style gaming, in order for the tribe to operate casino style gaming, it must enter into a tribal state compact. That's the only way that IGRA authorizes casino style gaming. Class two, on the other hand, can be operated without a tribal state compact. That falls under tribal jurisdiction with federal oversight. Class three, the only way it's legal is with that tribal state compact in place. So 
let's come back to the state of the industry now um, and think a little bit about that growth and its development and, and some ways in which the industry differs depending on how you take a look at it. Um, what we have here are some figures that actually are only just from the past decade that can illustrate the steady trajectory of growth. In fact, uh, very, very rapid growth that's beginning to level off now with the economic downturn. But from 1999 to 2008, as you can see, the industry grows from about a $10 billion industry to a $26.5 billion industry. Exceptional growth with new locations coming online as well as increased numbers of machines, games, table games, and so forth. So it's been a, a, a massive success story purely in terms of the dollars and cents. The pervasiveness also in terms of Indian gaming now, it's spread um, pretty much to every single state where you're going to have a federally recognized tribe. And so as you look at the map, you can see that there are states where there would be no Indian gaming. That's because there wouldn't be a federally recognized tribe or land that would meet the definition under federal law of Indian lands. So if there were to be a tribe or were to be land that would meet that definition, we could expect uh, the growth of gaming into those particular areas. So the growth of the industry uh, is often seen as uniform for all of the 225 tribes or so that have gaming operations. Well, they all must be doing well if the industry itself is topping $26 billion. But that's not actually the case. Instead, what we see in the United States is that there is a very full spectrum of Indian gaming. And one end of the spectrum that's important to mention is that not all tribes operate gaming. We have 562 federally recognized tribes and only about 225 of them or so, less than half, actually operate any kind of gaming at all. So many tribes, especially those in areas such as Alaska, simply do not have gaming enterprises. Among the tribes with gaming enterprises, there is a vast difference in the kind of enterprise that they offer. And you can imagine that if you think back to the map where we showed the, the federal Indian reservations. For those tribes that are lucky enough to have land near a metropolitan area, their gaming enterprise might be very successful. For tribes like those in North Dakota, maybe less so. So let's take a look at some of the variables for that profitability. Well, it shouldn't surprise you that as with real estate generally that the, the main mantra, of course, is uh, location, location, location. And it doesn't take uh, much of a social scientist or a lawyer to understand why that would be the case um, because if you have access to patrons or potential patrons, that's what's going to drive your revenue stream. So if, if, if you're thinking about bricks and mortar casinos. Um, but in terms of profitability beyond simply location, we can think about some other factors, some other variables. For instance, the existing socioeconomic deficit that the particular tribe faces. Remember that we are talking about a spectrum here, and while many tribes are located in rural areas, outlying kinds of areas, those tribes are, are therefore going to have high degrees of unemployment, high degrees of, of, of poverty, and so forth. So how the tribe is able to use the revenue to combat those particular uh, socioeconomic deficits is going to determine profitability in part of the casino. Secondly, the capacity of the government. If you think about the nature of institutions, political institutions, um, regulatory institutions, and so forth, a, a tribe that has greater capacity um, in those areas is going to have potentially greater capacity to build and operate a more successful casino. Thirdly, tribal prerogatives and priorities. Um, while actually under IGRA, there are some specified uses of revenue that we you'll just have to take on faith, um, that they start with the idea that the revenue must be used for the general welfare, general benefit of the tribe and its members before the tribe can do anything else. How the tribe chooses to use those revenues, though, is, is really going to be up to the tribe. Is it something basic as providing for infrastructure for running water? Are there going to be resources devoted to building a museum, um, to language classes, language preservation, and so forth? And then, of course, the nature of the political culture within the tribe, but also within the state in which the tribe is located, is, is an essential variable. 
and in the negotiation of something like a tribal state compact, that the, the historical nature of intergovernmental relations, whether close-knit or contentious, is going to potentially drive how profitable the casino is as well. So let's take a look at uh, a few of the tribal gaming enterprises that fall along that spectrum of success. Here we have the Fantasy Springs Resort Hotel and Casino that's owned and operated by the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians. That's the same band that was subject to that landmark Supreme Court case in 1987 that led to IGRA. Back in 1987, uh, the band was operating uh, uh, its high-stakes bingo game out of a makeshift trailer. Now, this is what it has for its Indian gaming operation near San Diego in California. The Foxwoods Resort Casino on the other side of the U.S., uh, owned and operated by the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation in Connecticut, and within driving distance of New York City and Boston, with literally millions of visitors every year. The Foxwoods Resort Casino is one of the most profitable casinos. Not one of the most profitable tribal casinos, one of the most profitable casinos in the world with about $1.5 billion in annual revenue. And under a revenue sharing agreement uh, with the state, Foxwoods, along with the Mohegan Sun, pays the state of Connecticut some $400 million every single year. And on the other end of the spectrum is Indian Gaming in North Dakota. This is the Spirit Lake Casino and Resort, uh, owned and operated by the Spirit Lake Nation near Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Devil's Lake is what passes for a metropolitan area in North Dakota. <laughs> has a population of about 7,000 and is about a two-hour, two-and-a-half-hour drive from Grand Forks, the nearest large city. So here you can see a much more modest facility, and the tribe itself is focused not on the profitability of its gaming enterprise, but the fact that it actually is uh, a job creator for tribal members. About 80% of the employees at the casino are tribal members. So this casino brings in enough so that the casino can continue to operate, keep its doors open, employ people, and provides enough revenue to the tribal government so that the government can offer some modest government services. The tribe itself, too, is very, very different than, say, the Pequots. The Pequots are a relatively small tribe with just a couple of hundred members. Uh, the Spirit Lake Nation is more typical of tribes in the middle of the country with several thousand members. Obviously, with more members, the government must provide more services, which costs more money. So all of that comes into play. I think we know these folks, by the way, because everyone in North Dakota knows somebody. <laughs> Just coming out of the buffet right after uh, church on Sunday. So to give you a little bit of an idea of how this spectrum looks in terms of dollars, our top line uh, are gaming enterprises, tribal gaming enterprises, that earn $250 million or more. Gaming enterprises like Foxwoods. You can see that that, in terms of the total number of operations, is less than 6%. So less than 6% of tribal casinos earn that much. But that 6% accounts for more than 40% of the industry's revenue. Down here on the bottom, we've got casinos that look like the Spirit Lake Casino, with uh, annual revenue of $10 million or less, or even $3 million or less. So together, that's about a third or so of tribal casinos. And they earn less than 2% of the industry's revenue. Putting it a different way, our light blue bar across the top, on this side, that 250 plus, 6% of the operations. 25 million or less, over half of the operations. Corresponding over here, 
that small light blue bar across the top, 42% of the revenue, that, that blue bar at the bottom, 7%. So over half of tribal casinos earn just 7% of that $26 billion total. So what has Indian gaming actually done? Well, it's done a number of intriguing things, but if you, you look at some of the numbers, um, you can see some the trajectory, and we will be looking forward to 2010 census numbers, but the tra trajectory for tribes overall is one where their socioeconomic deficits in the aggregate have been reduced. Um, in 1990, you can see tremendous rates of unemployment in excess of 50% for some tribes, even up to 70, 80, and even 90% in some areas of the United States. Uh, large, high poverty rates and disproportionate rates of various socioeconomic deficits. As you look at 2000, of course, this isn't, dis, this isn't disaggregating gaming from uh, general growth, however that might be occurring on reservations and in reservation communities, but there have been some significant improvements. Um, on the other hand, while tribal growth rates have been three times the general growth rate of the national economy at the time, tribes and American Indians overall continue to lag on many, if not most, socioeconomic indicators at a very high, very disproportionate rate. The impacts, and this could be uh, an extensive discussion, but the impacts are many. There are positive impacts, negative impacts, and it would be very uh, easy to do a cost-benefit kind of analysis if you were to be able to disaggregate the um, economic benefits and the social benefits from the economic costs and social costs, which gets a little bit more complicated. But on the whole, for tribes, everything really starts with jobs and job creation. The most important um, impact of Indian gaming for most tribes, actually, uh, particularly those at that far end of the spectrum, is job creation. The reduced poverty rates that come with that, um, also from a governmental perspective, the provision of infrastructure and public services, that has been a major impact of Indian gaming, as well as economic development. And now, increasingly, tribes are turning beyond gaming and thinking about not putting all their eggs in one basket. And so the diversification that's occurring for tribes in the U.S. is actually very intriguing, um, from stuff like making Kevlar vests for our armed forces to uh, being a chocolatier and that sort of thing. For state and local economies, um, what we see are uh, impacts that's, that spill over and off the reservation. Um, they can come in the form of the development of rural areas that have, are experiencing tremendous socioeconomic de deficits on and around the reservation in terms of increased tax revenue. Keep in mind when those folks come out of the Spirit Lake Buffet, um, the chances are really good that just about everything they ate at the buffet actually comes from off the reservation. So you're talking about vendors who themselves are employing individuals who are non-tribal and the tax revenue that accrues to that, as well as direct revenue sharing payments that are occurring throughout the U.S. where tribes have agreed to pay certain percentages directly to the state or localities. So what's next for Indian gaming in the U.S.? Well, one thing that we can be certain of is that it will continue to be controversial. We have a number of hot button issues related to Indian gaming that crop up in our news, in our popular culture, uh, in our state politics, and in our federal politics as well. Tribal state compacting, those agreements that are required for casino style gaming, make the news all the time. Uh, despite the nearly two decades of efforts of the Seminole Nation in Florida, it still has a, a highly questionable tribal state compact that it's still trying to negotiate with the governor and have it approved by the state legislature. Revenue sharing is becoming extremely controversial. Some tribes willingly enter into revenue sharing agreements in order to have some form of exclusivity. The Pequots are a nice example of that. Uh, other tribes enter into revenue sharing agreements only under pressure from the state as a condition of entering into the compact. And some tribes simply cannot afford to share their revenue. No tribe in North Dakota earns enough through its casino that it could share any of that with the state without having it undermine basic government services at the tribal level. Off-reservation gaming. 
IGRA allows uh, gaming on newly acquired lands, uh, not the, the reservations that were set in place, but new lands that the tribe might have acquired since 1988, only in very limited circumstances. But as you might imagine, tribes are trying to acquire land near metropolitan areas in hopes of a more profitable casino. This has been extremely controversial and extremely contentious in the U.S. Going along with that, of course, is land acquisitions. Tribal recognition. Our over 560 federally recognized tribes, there are other tribes that have been waiting decades uh, for federal recognition. There are some tribes that are recognized by state government only and not yet the federal government. And there are other groups that are trying for that tribal status. Indian gaming has greatly impacted how we view the tribal recognition process. And the regulation of Indian gaming is extremely controversial. Steve and I have been lucky enough to testify twice in front of Congress about Indian gaming regulation. And the idea is the impact of something like that Time Magazine article um, characterizing tribal recognition, or excuse me, tribal regulation as the fox guarding the hen house. In terms of the Obama administration, there's a lot yet to come. Um, but when Obama was running for office, he recognized the sovereign status of tribes. He called for intergovernmental, government to government relations, and that's significant. In terms of appointees to the administration, a little bit up in the air at this point. Ken Salazar, who is the Interior Secretary, and the Interior Department underneath that falls the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Ken Salazar has basically no record whatsoever um, in relation to American Indian tribes, and there's a lot of questions there about how um, his perception of, of tribes and intergovernmental relations. The Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, Larry Echohawk, who was appointed fairly recently and confirmed fairly recently, um, some cheered that, others were concerned about it because when, when Echo Hawk was in Idaho, um, he was arguing that the state didn't need to negotiate with tribes over Class Three gaming, a position that perhaps contravenes the spirit of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. The National Indian Gaming, gaming Commission, which is the federal regulatory agency that helps to oversee tribal gaming, is a little bit in flux. There's only three members of the commission. Uh, right now, the, the chair of the commission has recently stepped down, and there's an interim chair. So the question of what will happen for there, we're not sure. And of course, the economy, a lot of questions that are raised after a long period of exponential growth. The growth has become flat. The industry has matured in a lot of ways. But people have fewer dollars to spend. That's impacted Las Vegas and Atlantic City, but certainly many tribal government-run government, uh, government run operations as well. We've seen some cutbacks in operating hours, some layoffs, some hiring freezes, the kinds of things that actually no company wants to do necessarily. But remember the public policy goals here. Certainly no tribe and tribal government wants to do that, especially for its own members. And the potential even uh, bankruptcies and closures, one such casino, Casino Omaha, has actually closed down. So in our last couple of minutes, we'd like to leave you with a few takeaways. And we'd like to start with the idea of what the legacies of Indian gaming should be. Steve and I believe that Indian gaming in the U.S. will not have achieved its policy goals until we've reached certain milestones. One of those is that tribes have diversified economies, economies that are healthy and depend on a number of different industries and enterprises. That tribes should have income levels and employment that, uh, levels that are in line with the general population of the U.S. That we should not see our tribal communities lagging behind so staggeringly in terms of those socioeconomic indicators that tribes have strong and responsive governments that can address the needs of their members, and that IGRA and Indian gaming result in improved tribal, state, local, federal, intergovernmental relations, rather than further straining some of those relationships that may not have been strong to begin with. So a lot of changes in just 20 years. What do the next 20 years hold? Perhaps we'll achieve some of those uh, benchmarks and goals that Catherine mentioned. To be sure, what we can tell you is that there are going to be a lot more changes. 
the nature of the issues, the hot button issues that Catherine mentioned, it's changing every day. That's part of what's fascinating about thinking about the growth and changes in the industry. Technology innovation, always pushing the limits. The way that the games are operated, the type, the fact of the matter is, is that it's exceptionally difficult to regulate to stay ahead of technology. Market development as it continues to mature and the, the industry continues to basically flatten out if growth flattens out, um, question of where you go from here. Is it more games? Is it more operations? What's going to happen? A lot of legal and regulatory challenges are going to come to the fore because there are always critical political developments and challenges and controversies that are occurring mostly at the state level, but there always are, it seems like, some rumblings in Congress about what next and what should Congress do and should it take a look at opening up the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. So we believe that the real stories of Indian gaming, the ones that we've been illustrating for you today, um, they, they go really far beyond some of those cartoons and stereotypes in pop culture, obviously, but, you know, as academics, of course, we're going to say that. But what's really important to understand is that the industry has changed a lot of lives. It's been transformative on reservations. It's changed the nature of intergovernmental relations, where tribes now are increasingly visible and viable political actors. And that simply was not the case before. So what we see is stories that can be told about real businesses, real people, and real politics that's occurring on the ground every day. We'd like to thank you for your attention. We don't know if there's time for questions, but if there isn't, we'll certainly be available and visible. What a terrific opportunity for us to speak with you, and we, we've enjoyed giving you this crash course. Thanks so much.